I'm not the biggest fan of public speaking, but as a PhD researcher, sometimes I don't have a choice. This is Chris, a friend and researcher at Lucy Cavendish College, and today we're going to talk about your research. So Chris, tell me about it. What inspired you to do this work? Thank you. Um, it started a number of years ago. I'm a behavioural scientist, so I understood the literature well on therapy and exposure therapy in particular. But what really was the genesis of this particular iteration was working with my nephew. Mm. So at the time, he was at college and he was very anxious and worried about an upcoming presentation. And I just really, really wanted to help him. That's mm. where this started from. So because it was during COVID, I was helping him remotely. Mm. I was sort of his online coach. <laughs> and I wanted to try to improve the efficacy of that process. So long story short, I ended up building a sort of 3D model of his college. It was very simple. I built, put it together quite quickly because he had mm. a presentation coming up within a week. Mm. And it was a very crude simulate room. It was with blocks and it looked very basic. <laughs> and he could enter that classroom as an avatar and so oh, could cool. I. And he was presenting to me. And then I started to add more audience members. And even though they were very basic sort of pixelated Lego men-esque figures <laughs> and they were hardly moving around, it ended up being really effective. And he ended up going ahead with his presentation. It went really well. And now he really likes presentations. We went for a meal recently and he gave a little speech. He would have <laughs> never have done that before. Yeah. And to me, that showed the potential of it. Mm. It was N of one, a proof of concept. Mm. But it showed me that I could build something that could potentially be accessible remotely. Mm. And because I have a background working in tech, I was a consultant and technical director before re-entering okay. academia. I knew I could build something much more sophisticated mm -hmm. and I knew I could build something photorealistic. Mm. So it started with me trying to help one person, but I knew this had the potential to help millions of people. Mm. So that's what originally got me excited about it. Amazing. That's such an incredible story. And I can completely relate to what your nephew went through. I'm not the biggest fan of public speaking. And as a PhD researcher, you, it's something you kind of have to do, unfortunately. So this technology sounds amazing. Yeah, thank you. It's really common, so mm -hmm. you're definitely not alone. 80% mm -hmm. of UK university students suffer from speech anxiety. Wow. And it's detrimental for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. So it's bad for um, physical health, mental health, academic attainment, career progression. Ultimately, in a way, it's capping human potential. So mm -hmm. it's well worth investigating better ways to try to find accessible solutions. Mm -hmm. So I'm really passionate about trying to find solutions too, because I think it could help a lot of people. So how does this work? Probably the best way is to try it out for yourself, if you'd like. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> so once you pop this on, you'll be transported into a training environment. Okay. And this particular training environment will put you on stage looking at an audience of around okay. 100 or so people. Okay. So you give it okay. a go and you can try oh, it out for oh, yourself. I'll take my glasses off. I... There you go. Okay. So how the platform oh works. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so. Oh can, my goodness. <laughs> can you see the audience? I can animated? see the audience. Yeah. So, <laughs> There's someone I recognize. <laughs> so that audience in partic is particularly fear-inducing because you'll notice the front row are sat quite close to you. Very close. Also, they're highly disinterested as yeah. well. And what we're finding is that that really increases levels of anxiety. So we want these training environments to be really difficult. Mm. And you'll notice it's a packed room as well. Very. And there are lots of distractions going on. Some people are laughing. Some people are looking around. They're disinterested. Mm -hmm. And how this works more broadly is the platform is comprised of two main components. There are learning materials and there are training environments. And users follow a tailored journey that is best served to solve their particular learning outcome. They might want to get better at presenting or perhaps they're working towards a job interview. And underneath that, what underpins the process is a gamified mechanism mm -hmm. whereby as they complete tasks on the platform, the virtual reality training environments become increasingly challenging and more and more difficult. And we're finding that when users do that, when they follow that journey, they not only become more confident and skilled, they start to really enjoy public speaking. And they like this gamified process to the extent where they then pursue real world opportunities. And that's really encouraging for us researchers because we know that fear and anxiety are maintained or worsened through avoidance. Amazing. I really love it, like <laughs> the fact that it's real people, um, not animated. And yeah, as you say, this is a tough crowd. <laughs> no one is smiling. <laughs> okay, so now I'm in a stadium, I can see lots and lots of people. Why have you decided to create spaces <laughs> like this? 
So this leads us on to overexposure therapy. And that's a concept I developed to try to increase the efficacy of traditional exposure therapy. In traditional exposure therapy, say for the treatment of speech anxiety or glossophobia, which is the fear of public speaking, okay. that's normally delivered one-to-one -one with a therapist and they'll try to create a gradation. So they might ask the patient to present in an empty room mm -hmm. to an audience of zero, if you like, and then to an audience of one and two and three and five and 10. But traditionally, it, that scales to an audience size of around 20 or 30, around a conventional classroom environment. Mm. What I'm doing with overexposure therapy is going significantly further beyond that. So I'm using emerging technology to give people the opportunity to repeatedly train in highly extreme scenarios. So not just 10 and 20 people, but you can present in front of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people yeah. with all sorts of distractions. And <laughs> you could think of it perhaps as the psychological equivalent of running with weights or at mm. high altitude, provide you with extra confidence, grit, resilience, adaptability. And what I'm finding is a very novel treatment approach, but I'm finding it's looking very promising. We did an experiment with uh, students in a summer school mm. and we found that just a 30 minute session of overexposure therapy was able to significantly decrease levels of anxiety. Mm. And in the current round of experiments we're doing with students at UCL and Cambridge, we're giving them a one week treatment plan. And in that case, overexposure therapy was effective for 100% of the participants. Wow. So it has a lot of promise. It's yeah. very novel. I need to do more work in it. But that's why I'm putting you in such an extreme environment. <laughs> But, this is definitely extreme. <laughs> I feel weird. Yeah, uh, because if you imagine where people normally train is in their bedrooms on their own. Yeah. So therefore it feels like a step up when you present to even a small audience. Yeah. If by contrast you were practicing in front of tens of thousands of people every night <laughs> and all sorts of things were going wrong, hopefully those real world opportunities will start to feel more like a step down. Mm. So that's the idea behind the concept. Okay, so I'm going to leave the stadium. I think I understand overexposure therapy now. Um, so before this, what was available? Therapist-guided exposure therapy had a lot going for it. It's very effective. Mm -hmm. My concern with it was the scalability. Mm -hmm. The scale of the solution was not commensurate to the scale of the problem. Okay. And when looking into that further, I found that one of the main barriers involves costs. If you do private treatments, you have the financial cost. If you do NHS treatments, you have the time cost. It can mm -hmm. take 24 weeks to access and complete due to current waiting lists. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I wanted to address those two friction points. Therefore, I sort of set out on this journey to create not only the most effective treatment for the biggest fear, I was determined to make it freely accessible and instantly accessible okay. because a plan that takes 24 weeks to access and complete is just not a viable option if you're presenting in a week or two's time. Mm, okay, so where do you get access to this technology? If you are an organization and like a healthcare provider, then you need to get in contact directly. But okay. if you're a member of the public or a student, then you can access it today for free from a dedicated website. Amazing. And while that's a good start, it is free. It wouldn't truly be free if you needed an expensive VR headset to access the training materials. So you can Yes, you can do that, but you can also access it with a phone. And it's very easy to use. You just scan a QR code, the training environment ends up on your phone, and then you insert it into one of these, which is a device mount. And these are widely available on the internet, they're very low cost. And to make it easier still, if you're a student at Cambridge University, then there are these device mounts at Moore's Library and at the West Hub, because my lab, the Immersive Technology Lab, are collaborating with them and they also provide in-person presenting opportunities. So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible because I really want this to help as many people as possible.